Most of the time when people talk about the Harlem Renaissance, also known as the New Negro Movement, they talk about all the artists, all the wonderful artists and the musicians, such as Langston Hughes, the father of jazz poetry, who's one of my favorites, and the leader of the Harlem Renaissance, or Meta Fuller or Augusta Savage, the female sculptors, or even Aaron Douglas, the artist, or Louis Armstrong, the jazz musician, or playwrights such as Wallace Thurman or William Rapp. Only a small number of people will get into the real estate and the real property and the money that was floating around in Harlem through African-American hands. Did you know that African-Americans acquired $60 million worth of real property in Harlem within the span of 15 years? And I mean, just the Harlem. This was in the year 1925. And please realize that $60 million in 1925 equates to $1 billion today. Now, according to the Smithsonian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture, quote, at the height of the movement, Harlem was the epicenter of American culture. The neighborhood bustled with African American owned and run publishing houses and newspapers, music companies, playhouses, nightclubs, and cabarets. The literature, music, and fashion they created defined culture and cool for blacks and white alike in America and around the world. That's a little bit of background for those who don't know about the Harlem Renaissance. Now let's get into this real estate and money. Coming from Democrat and Chronicle newspaper from Rochester, New York in 1925, quote, in one square mile a little north of Central Park in New York City live more Negroes than had ever been gathered together in the history of the world. That square mile is Harlem, a colored city as large as all of Memphis or Dallas, where in 15 years, Negroes have acquired real estate worth $60 million. Throughout colored America, from Massachusetts to Mississippi and across the continent to Los Angeles and Seattle, its name, which as of 15 years ago had scarcely been, now stands for the Negro Metropolis, writes James Weldon Johnson in the March issue of the Survey Graphic. The first number of a national magazine to be given over to interpreting Harlem as the capital of the Negro race and the Mecca of the new Negro. So I'm going to jump right into part two for those who want to continue the article on this black history moment of the Harlem Renaissance when it comes to real estate and property owned by African-Americans. Again, this is coming from the Democrat and Chronicle newspaper of 1925. Starting the quote now. Harlem is indeed the great Mecca for the sightseer, the pleasure seeker, the curious, the adventurous, the enterprising, the ambitious, and the talented of the whole Negro world. For the lure of it has reached down to every island of the Carib Sea and has penetrated even to Africa. Harlem is not merely a Negro colony or community. It is a city within a city, the greatest Negro city in the world. It is not a slum or a fringe. It is located in the heart of Manhattan and occupies one of the most beautiful and healthful sections of the city. It is not a quarter of dilapidated tenements, but is made of new law apartments and handsome dwellings. With well-lit and well-paved streets, with its own churches, social and civic centers, shops, theaters, and other places of amusement. End quote. That was just given the overall feel of what things look like. Now they're going to get into what things look like racially if you would just ride through Manhattan and end up in Harlem. So just start imagining, right? The population suddenly darkens and he rides through 25 solid blocks where the passers-by, the shoppers, those sitting in restaurants, coming out of the theaters, standing in doorways, and looking out of the windows are practically all Negroes. And then he emerges where the population suddenly becomes white again. There's nothing like it in any other city in the country, for there is no preparation for it. No change in the character of the houses and streets, no change indeed in the appearance of the people, except for their color, end quote. Now you can see how spectacular it was to them back in 1925 to see something like this happening in the United States of America, in New York, in Manhattan, in Harlem. Remember this great migration took place a lot of people from the South in different parts of the South with different things to add to Harlem in itself with the music and the different vibes from different places in the South came and it became a Mecca. Now, despite the fact that we were talking about Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance, this Renaissance was happening around the nation in various big cities in the States. The Harlem Renaissance, again, was so big that black culture leapt across the ocean. 
It was something brand new, not only for this nation, the United States of America, but it was something brand new for the entire world to see unfold before their very eyes. New sounds, new art, new perspective, new freedom, the new Negro movement, all new, a perspective that the world had never seen from African-Americans. So how are African-Americans able to purchase $60 million of real estate in Harlem within the span of 15 years during the Harlem Renaissance between the 1920s and the 1930s? I mean, well, they had money. It's often a mistake to believe that African-Americans just always were just broke down. Okay, no, that's a myth. Truth is, real estate was one of the main things African-Americans did. And there are several reasons for that. Two of the main reasons because it got you money quickly. And not only that, it provided a place of quote unquote sanctuary, which was necessary back in those days. Black people and white people were not able to be integrated as they are now. If a black person lived or traveled in the wrong places, they can get So it was very important, very important for African-Americans to always have their real estate investments and property land investments and build up their communities all on their own. If you don't know how dangerous it was, I want to talk about somebody named Victor Hugo Green, who was actually born in Harlem and a part of the Harlem Renaissance. He was the one who came out with the Green Book, the Negro Motorist Green Book, or the Negro Traveler's Green Book, which it was retitled. He was also a part of the Harlem Renaissance, understanding that black people could not travel just any old way and, and stay any old places. That meant danger to their lives. So now that that's settled, let's get back to the Harlem Renaissance series. Real estate in Harlem was everything. There was an African-American real estate investor named William H. Wortham. He was the president of Philip A. Payton Jr. Company, a pioneer African-American real estate company in Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance. And according to the New York Age newspaper of 1928, he had years of experience as an appraiser and salesman as head of one of the largest African-American owned real estate businesses of its kind. So what he said, pull weight. He opens up large apartment buildings and they built several, several houses for black people. And as the need grew, many African-American real estate investors provided homes. Now, during this time, there was a large influx, larger than it's ever been, of immigrants coming into, Afro-immigrants, I should say, being attracted to the Harlem Renaissance and Harlem. Because of the real estate that was owned by African-Americans at that time, they were able to move right in. It was a win-win. They're listed in the papers, Afro-Puerto Ricans, Afro-Cubans, more people from the West Indies, and they were able to make Harlem their permanent home because of all the real estate African-Americans bought up and were now selling and renting out. Literally before Afro-immigrants were able to move in groves to Harlem, even before 1920s, African-Americans from the South were already migrating to the North, buying up properties. According to the New York Age of 1920, quote, homes are bought and colored investors stop paying rent. Quote, there were 21 Negro real estate offices in Harlem doing business at varying proportions. They were buying homes to save themselves from profiteering landlords and by enterprising people with capital who find Harlem real estate a paying investment. So this would be my part four, I think, on Harlem. This will probably be the final because there's so much to say about Harlem and I could go on and on. But right now I'm going to focus on the father of Harlem, who is credited with being the father of Harlem. And that is Philip A. Payton Jr. Now, if you watched my last video, I mentioned his real estate company, Philip A. Payton Jr. Company. So now I'm going to get into it really, really quickly. Now, he was born in Massachusetts in 1876, the son of a father who was a barber and a mother who was a hairdresser. He attended Livingstone College in North Carolina, but then he left and went back to Massachusetts to take up barbering. However, that wasn't what he wanted to do. Then he went to New York, and this is where he ended up working at a real estate company a white owned real estate company. And he hated what he saw. He saw discrimination against African-Americans. This is exactly where he found his passion for life and he wanted to fight against it. So what did he do? He launched Philip A. Payton Jr. Company. Now, according to the New York age, it was founded in 1900, the year 1900. Some write-ups will say it was founded in 1904 or 1908, but I wouldn't found an ad. Back in 1902, that says he was already a broker and had his business up and running. So yes, the New York age is right. He started his business in the year 1900. That next year, he got married to his wife, Mary P. Wortham, Peyton. And here's where all the fighting began. So white landlords were busy kicking out black tenants. Well, when Peyton Jr. came around, he started buying up the buildings that were empty, moving in black tenants, 
And he also bought up some buildings that were owned by white landlords. And because they were busy kicking out African-American tenants, he started kicking out white tenants as well. And when he kicked out the white tenants, he moved the black ones in. It was a whole thing. Now, the more black tenants moved in, the more white people was like, we're leaving. This freed up a lot of the buildings for Peyton Jr. to continue to buy buildings and put African-Americans in them. For those who don't know, white flight is when they feel too many African-Americans or people of color are moving into their neighborhoods. And so they will just leave and go somewhere else. Well, Philip A. Peyton Jr. took advantage of the white flight. And there were other real estate brokers, too, who were African-American. But Peyton was the big man in Harlem. Now, his company soared through his honesty and fair dealings. Quote, his company became the most well-known African-American real estate company in New York, the United States, the Caribbean, and in Europe. He was even out there buying properties in Berlin and Munich. Now, listen, he passed away in 1917, but his company didn't. He passed away of cancer, I believe. His brother-in-law. William H. Wortham, I mentioned him in the last video, he took over as president. And by 1928, they had like $60 million worth of property, child. This was smack dab in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. Every black person around the globe wanted to come to Harlem. And because of what Peyton's company started, and many other African-American realtors, they were able to. 